Okay, well, welcome to the Precinct 11 uh, for Community Forum. We haven't ever done this before, so, and um, through Zoom, so thank you for joining us uh, remotely, and, and um, we apologize in advance if there's any technical issues. My name is Shira Fisher. I'm a town meeting member. I live on Summit Avenue, um, and hosting here with um, Shana and Nick, who have helped us organize this, and the rest of the uh, town meeting, um, the current town meeting members. There are 15 of us from Precinct 11. So I'm just going to show you a schedule. Let's see if I can get this to work of um, what we're going to be doing tonight. <clears throat> so here's a screen share. So this is the Precinct 11 Community Forum. This is uh, Precinct 11, <laughs> just so you guys know uh, who's in and out and what the neighborhood is. We're going to do some intros and announcements, a little bit of information about the elections, and we can just chat a little bit about neighborhood issues. At 7.15, we have all three select board candidates here, and we're going to um, ask them to tell us a little about their campaign and their positions, and then open up for questions. And then at 7.45, we'll start talking to town meeting members. So we have um, a number of open slots and 10 candidates, and we hope they'll all get a chance to introduce themselves and um, meet members of the community. Um, any questions about that so far? So one important thing we want you to know is about the election on uh, June 9th. So the hours have been changed a bit. Nick, do you want to explain that? Sure. Um, so the select board voted to change the hours um, yeah, sort of to protect poll workers. Um, so the hours now are from noon to 8 p.m., which is a change. Mm -hmm. It eliminates that morning slot when a lot of people vote. So we want to be sure people know about that. Um, tell your neighbors and friends as well. And a couple of polling locations have changed. We can, you can find that online, but for anyone here who's in Precinct 11, you'll still vote at the Driscoll School. Okay, so Okay, sorry about that. So the um, voting by mail information is here. I know that it might be hard um, to see the links, so we'll we'll send this around, but you can request a ballot by mail. It'll be sent to you and you can mail it back in. Uh, you can request it with a form, but if, even if you can't get the, and um, Rebecca Mountner put the forms on her porch if anybody wants to pick them up. But if you can't get the form, you can even just um, write on a piece of paper your name, your address, your date of birth and contact information and you can take a picture of that or scan it and send it or mail it into the town clerk. So everybody who wants to vote by mail can vote by mail. Um, but to do so, you really have to get the paperwork in in the next day or two because the town's clerk, clerk's mm -hmm. office has a lot to process. They have to mail the ballot to you, and it's not postmarked by June 9th. It has to be received by the clerk by June 9th, which by my reckoning means to be really sure you need to mail it um, a week from this uh, Friday just to be sure that it'll get there in time. Um, we, there's also still going to be elections in person, and there is a need for poll workers. So if anybody is um, willing to be a poll worker, you need to be a registered voter. Uh, you'll earn $175 for the day. They provide masks. Um, if this is something you're interested in, we can send you more information about that. Um, I want to turn it over now to Tommy Vitolo, our state rep. He has a few words for us. Hi, everyone. And, um... Maybe not now, but later, I ask you to just take a minute and reflect on Memorial Day and, and what that entails, what that means for you. And thank you for this candy. Um, that was Angelina. Uh, quickly, uh, this is me, 617-872-8921, tommy.vitolo at mahouse.gov. Call me, email me anytime for anything COVID-related or not. I and my office will do everything we can uh, to help you with whatever it is that, that you need some help with. Um, also, uh, I have a vote by mail website too. Super easy, it's got the information there, it's got the form there. Uh, if you're having trouble finding the notes from this meeting, you can always go to tommyvitolo.com slash vote by mail. And since there are so many candidates and it's so hard to go canvassing, I've got them all in one place. tommyvitolo.com slash 2020 Brookline candidates has every candidate for every office on the ballot June 9th um, with the endorsements, with the League of Women voters responses, with photos when I was able to get them. 
Uh, so it's one convenient place for everybody. In fact, I got Nancy's photo earlier today. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, so that's the story for me. Uh, really, call me if there's ever anything I can do for you. Uh, that's, that's what I spend my time doing right now is helping, helping neighbors like you with whatever's going on. So best of luck to everyone and thank you, uh, Shira and Nick and everyone who put this together. Thank, thank you. you, Tommy. So next, um, we have a little time just for chatting. Uh, we thought maybe people who are not candidates might want to just introduce themselves so we can get to know the neighborhood. And if people want to talk about the um, issues that they want to make sure to hear about in the next hour and a half, um, this is a good opportunity to raise those issues. And we will, we're not a huge group. I don't think we need to raise hands unless that becomes an issue. So please go ahead um, if anybody wants to introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. Two other town meeting members, current town meeting members want to introduce themselves? Hi, Joe. Sure, could you just call Hello, us everyone. and just say their name and where we live so we just get a sense of who's on the call? Okay, it's David Lasquier on Winchester Street, town meeting member. <clears throat> okay, Rebecca, why don't you go ahead? Sure, I'm Rebecca Plout Mountner, uh, current town meeting member running for re election, and I'm at the corner of Summit in York. I see Jonathan Golden. Uh, Jonathan Golden, I live at 1450 Beacon Street. And Martha. Martha Gray, 113 Summit, the corner of uh, Summit and Jordan. Ken Lewis. I'm at uh, 232 Summit Ave. Um, I'm in, uh, uh, I'm a current town meeting member of second, second year of the three year term. Great, and Len. Hi, I'm Len Woolley. I live on 119 Lancaster Terrace. I'm a town meeting member. David Kruinghaus. Hi, I'm David Kruinghaus. And I live on Westbourne, just across the street from Driscoll School. Lisa. Hi, um, I'm running for town meeting member. I live in 252 Summit Avenue. Great, Nancy. Nancy, I think you're still on mute. I'm trying to unmute you. Nope, we'll come back to Nancy. David Pollack. Uh, hi, everybody. I live across the street from Len at uh, 112 Lancaster Terrace, and I'm a, um, I'm a current town meeting member. Thank you, David. Nancy, back to you. OK. Um, we are going to move to 190 Lancaster Terrace uh, starting from July 1st. And I'm running for town member. Great. Right. Joan. <laughs> hi, Joan Lancourt. Oh, hi. Um, I'm Joan Lancourt. I, I don't live in your precinct. I'm just listening. I live um, on uh, Beaconsfield Road near Dean. Okay, please. Pleased to have you join us. You can visit anytime. David. Hi, um, I'm David Lowe, another David. Um, I live on 177 Mason Terrace, across the street directly from Lake Petit uh, Preschool, and have been, I'm an incumbent town meeting member for about a decade running for re-election. Nick Gertler. Hi, I'm Nicholas Gertler, uh, 49 Summit Avenue, current town meeting member. I'm actually pausing re-election. I'll explain why as we go, but uh, happy to be here with you. Um, Margaret. Margaret Rhodes, let's see, you're on mute. Let's, let's try it again. Margaret. Okay, I live at... 309 Mason Terrace, down towards Cole Road. And Bonnie? Hi, um, Bonnie jones Decent, uh, current town meeting member, up for re-election again this year. Okay, next is Anne. Hi, um, I'm Ann Weaver. I live at 87 Mason Terrace between Lancaster 
and Summit. And I'm running for town meeting member for my first term. Nice to meet you, Anne. Next on my screen is Rebecca Redner, but there's no video. Are you there, Rebecca? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is in a noisy room. Okay. <laughs> and then I think, let's see, I see a few more names. Randy Parker. Nope. Okay. Ronit. Hi, I'm Renee Rubenfeld. I live on 172 Mason Terrace, uh, next to Le Petit and across from David. And Savion. Okay, anybody else who didn't get to introduce themselves? Uh, Shira, you did not get to introduce oh. yourself. <laughs> That's true. My name is Shira Fisher. I've been a town meeting member for, this is, actually, I should check what year. I don't remember how many years. I live on Summit Ave um, with my husband and three little girls. And it's oh, so nice to see you all. Uh, I'll hand it off to Nick, who didn't introduce herself yet, and then Shana. <laughs> I'm Nicole McClelland. Um, I live on Jordan Road, and I'm finishing up my first term. So I'm up for re-election for a town meeting as well. And I just got a little pop in behind me. That's my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you everybody for being here. It's good to have this turnout and um, hopefully this will be the first of many uh, forums that we can do as a precinct. And Shanna, Shanna. Hi, I'm Shanna Giora Gorfine. I'm a town meeting member also. I live at 66 Winchester Street, um, actually just, just next door to David Lescoyer, um, next building over. Um, I've been a town meeting member since, I think, I think 2011, but I would have to check. Um, and I'm in the middle of my three-year term now. And we had one more um, person comment. Rebecca is in the noisy room, but she lives at 227 Summit and she's looking <laughs> forward to the election. Anybody else want to introduce themselves? Okay, so we're right on time. We're now going to start the um, select board forum. I'm going to hand it over to Nick and then we'll be able to hear from our candidates. Great. And just to remind people, since you're here, um, you know, we do have some questions for the select board members, but it would be, or for the candidates, but it would be great um, to hear from the participants what you would like to know from them. So I'll start with, um, we can start with opening statements from each of the candidates. And just so that um, Heather, John, and Eric, so you know, for each of these, I'll give you the order before I give you the question. So you know, you know, who will go first, second, and third. But participants, viewers, you can use the chat feature on Zoom. Um, I'm not going to be checking email during this, so do that, and we'll be able to see what your questions are, and we can ask those of the candidates. So for this, we'll start, um, we'll do Heather, Eric, John will be our order, and go ahead with uh, introductions and your opening statements. And I'm just going to add one thing. If people can stay on mute unless they're asking a question, that way there won't be background noise. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My name is Heather Hamilton. I am running for re-election to the select board. I'm a project manager in the transportation practice at a civil engineering firm in Boston. I have a master's in both transportation policy and public administration. Over the past three years, I have demonstrated my values in a number of initiatives. I have co-sponsored numerous warrant articles that help to address our response to climate change. I have overseen innovative transportation pilots. I co-chaired the campaign for Driscoll, and I'm leading a committee to build more senior affordable housing in Brookline Village. Over the next three years, I would like to finish the work I started on the Land Bank Study Committee to recommend that we put the Community Preservation Act, CPA, back before the voters in order to raise funds for open space, preservation, and affordable housing. I want to experiment with new transportation pilots that, would, that will put moving people first, not single occupant vehicles. I would like to continue to help recruit more diverse points of view for boards and commissions, and especially town meeting, who ultimately decide many of our community's values and where we allocate our precious dollars. We are in the midst of a real budget crisis. The town took action to furlough some employees to balance the budget for fiscal year 20, but severe cuts are looming for fiscal years 21 and perhaps 22. We do not yet know by how much our revenues will decrease and when life will return to normal, if ever. I'm committed to making this process as transparent, as collegial, and as equitable as possible. 
I'm asking for your vote this townwide election season. Thank you. Thank you, Heather and Eric. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Eric Hyatt, and I grew up at 71 Mason Terrace in Precinct 11. Um, the, uh, my whole childhood was spent in Quarry Hill neighborhood, and uh, now to this day when it snows, I yearn toward the top of Summit Avenue. Just something in me feels drawn to the top of the hill. Um, I'm really uh, excited to have the opportunity uh, to speak with Precinct 11. Thank you all for um, organizing this amazing um, get together on Memorial Day. Um, I am uh, running as a progressive. I've been endorsed by a group called Brookline for Everyone, which has also endorsed Heather Hamilton. Brookline for Everyone has some candidates for town meeting in, um, in Precinct 11, um, and uh, in particular, um, uh, my good friend Ann Weaver is running for the first time and um, I'm wishing her luck as well as uh, the rest of the Brookline for Everyone slate. I worked uh, for 25 years as a, uh, an executive for Microsoft, Experian and Deutsche Bank doing uh, uh, contract negotiation. I have negotiated contracts about three times the size of the Brookline budget. Uh, I moved back to Brookline in 2008 and since then I've been involved in public service in the community. Um, I uh, taught English, ESL at the Brookline Library I work with um, uh, people who uh, live in Brookline Housing Authority Housing. I teach a class called Telling Your Story, which is funded by the Office of Diversity, Inclusion and Community Relations. And I'm definitely running as a pro-inclusion progressive. I think that some issues um, have come up in the past year that um, show Brookline in a, in a bad light. And uh, that's what drove me into the race. Um, I don't know if I've taken up my 90 seconds, but anyway, thank you for having me. And I look forward to uh, taking your questions. Thank you, Eric and John. Hello, Precinct 11, and thank you very much for hosting this forum. It really is um, a pleasure to be here and to be able to share my views and also to hear from you. Let's be upfront with each other about something. A year ago, I was involved in something called Spend Smart, and Spend Smart. Um, got involved in a question that uh, Brookline, uh, that, that, excuse me, the Driscoll was tied up in, in terms of whether there would be a new Driscoll school. And the people behind Spend Smart thought that there should be a new Driscoll school, but they thought that the way the town was going about it was wrong. And it turned out that the voters agreed with us. Um, even in Precinct 11, nearly uh, split um, on that question. What gave me the most satisfaction was that my involvement in that question led to my involvement in the override question last December, which was successful in getting an override, a debt exclusion passed so that we can be looking forward now to the day when a new Driscoll school opens um, for Precinct 11 and for um, all of the Driscoll community. The other thing that gives me satisfaction is knowing that I have entered this select board race as a person who has been involved for a long time, longer than perhaps I, I, I should be willing to admit, but let's just say some decades. And I've been in, at town meeting during that time. I've been on the advisory committee during that time. I was elected chair of the advisory committee during that time. And the reason I bring it up is that it reflects something about my values. Um, I value people who, first of all, show up, um, I value people who put in the work. Uh, I value people who learn over time from experience and then put that learning into practice. And I think that a position as important to Brookline as the board of the select board, excuse me, um, requires people who have done that work, shown that experience, been tested by their, their fellow townspeople. And in the end, those townspeople, not the individual him or herself, but those townspeople, and over 200 of them in my case, have said, this person is who we can trust to lead Brookline during one of the most difficult periods that we've ever experienced, and that is this COVID-19 period. So, on the question of values, some people like to use labels. Progressive is a label. I feel we're all progressive in Brookline. I don't know any, I don't know too many townspeople who would say, I don't believe Brookline should make progress in, in providing for all of its citizens. 
But I think that um, when, when, if you're going to introduce labels, let's also talk about experience and let's, let's also talk about uh, knowledge and let's also talk about the testimony of ta the uh, people who have worked with me that I'm the kind of person that they feel has the leadership qualities that Brooklyn needs right now. Thank you. I hope I didn't go too long. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, Eric, and John for your introductions. Um, again, if anyone has questions, feel free to submit those. I'll start with one from within precinct 11, which is, um, and the order for this will be Eric, John, and then Heather. So the question is, even before COVID-19 hit, Brookline was facing a structural deficit and BFAC came up with many possible approaches to balancing the budget. What ideas do you have for how Brookline can increase revenue? What cuts do you think Brookline should make to the town budget to avoid raising taxes on residents? Or do you think we should raise taxes on residents? Eric. Thank you. I'm not sure how long we have to respond, so I'll just keep it as quick as possible. Um, so when I announced that I was running for this office, I had issues of fairness and inclusion first in mind. Um, my mom hung on to her house on Mason Terrace. I'm sure a lot of you knew her, Barbara Helfgott Hyatt. She hung in there for about 43 years on Mason Terrace. And she finally got pushed out due to, um, you know, just the rising cost of living in Brookline, frankly. Um, and uh, wasn't able to, to find a way to stay in her home for all that time. So that's what kind of drove me into the race was seeking fairness. Now we're in the middle of a true global disaster. There's no other word for COVID-19 than a disaster, which means Brookline must seek disaster relief funds at the state and federal level. This is a disaster. If it were a hurricane, we'd be seeking disaster relief. We need disaster relief for COVID. In terms of raising revenues, I think that um, the number one thing I would do is add housing to Brookline. Uh, Brookline for Everyone is recommending we add about 3,300 units of housing, and I think that's a good, you know, kind of way object to think with as a number um, to bring in new revenues. A lot of that would be senior housing, and a lot of that would be mixed-use development, so a bold redevelopment plan. In terms of making cuts, it's way too soon to talk about cuts. We need to try to get emergency funds first before, before we can do anything. Finally, I do support the BFAC report, or much of it anyway. I think it is a solid um, framework for how to, to make decisions. And I especially like the idea of warrant articles being vetted for fiscal soundness. Thank you. Thank you, Eric and John. Uh, yes, uh, and thank you for the question. I think that Unfortunately, um, it's too easy to approach the question of what do we do next by saying we, we will find some rescue funds from outside sources that will come to our rescue and, and get us out of this mess. Um, the fact of the matter is there's already rescue funds pouring in. There's also the reality that state budgets are going to be hit with billions of dollars uh, in lost revenue, and the reality that local town budgets, including Brookline's, are going to be hit with millions of dollars in lost revenues, and there are going to be trade-offs. And you can't avoid talking about trade-offs by talking about federal rescues. Um, and you can't avoid trade-offs by talking about how it's too early. Here's what we know. We know we're going to have to spend more money on public health. We know we're going to have to spend more money on aspects of the school operations that have been changed drastically because of COVID. Schools are going to have to open and perhaps be at 40% capacity. Schools are going to open and have to do sanitizing all day long, repeatedly, in room after room. Schools are going to open and they're going to have to have public health professionals on site to um, check the children in as they arrive. All of that is going to cost more money and that's going to involve trade-offs. And fortunately for us, some of the work of determining what those trade-offs are is already taking place um, among some very talented people at Town Hall. Uh, the staff, uh, Mel Kleckner and his staff, uh, the staff on the school side, Ben Lummis, um, uh, and, and soon to be uh, interim superintendent, Bill Marini, um, 
they are working on issues of furloughs. They are working on issues of figuring out which programs need to be emphasized and which programs perhaps can be looked at for savings. And so as a select board member, I, I want to be part of that conversation and I want to be part of the decision making on the trade-offs. And I'm willing to take the consequences if that means some of the areas of, of both the town side and the school side budgets have to, have to be trimmed back. And I'm also willing to talk about overrides, but I don't think we should talk about it at the beginning of the process. I think the, the override discussion happens after you have done the hard work of looking at the trade-offs that you can and are being required, unfortunately, to make. And then when you find that you've made every one that you can make uh, and that the remaining ones are unacceptable, that's when you begin the discussion of overrides. Thank you, John. And Heather, to you. Um, I'm glad that John brought up uh, trade-offs. So I, we're not gonna have an easy solution. Um, and, and I'll remain open uh, as I'm sure the other two candidates uh, are to you know what's on the table we need to know we need to understand what the proposed cuts are um, you know an override I, I've actually worked on a number of of overrides both debt exclusion and operational and I have to I have to say a lot of people are really nervous right now about their own financial security and to advocate for an override right now without knowing all of the details as to what where the money would go what it would fund what are the trade-offs you know are we cutting teachers are we cutting sanitation workers what are the cuts that would have to happen in order to balance the pud the budget how much of a, a delta is there and how do people feel about that and are we making brookline less affordable for people just like eric's mother so all of these are trade-offs and it has to be a community discussion. Uh, that's what I really like about serving on the town uh, government is that we are a town and, uh, and it, sometimes it's a slow process, but many eyes um, see the budget and we all get to talk at town meeting to talk about our values and where we put our dollars. As for the BFAC report, I definitely agree with many of the recommendations. One of the things that we must do is put a lot more energy into economic development, which is new growth. That is one way that we can try to avoid doing an override or making the cuts. Um, but the town has to serve as a partner. You know, we don't have the money to go in and invest. We need to entice investment. And so that is something that I look forward to hearing more uh, from the BFAC members uh, and their report. Thank you all. Next question comes from Lynn Foley. Um, Lynn, I know you're on. Would you like to ask your question about um, pedestrian and motor vehicle um, safety or would you want me to ask it for you? Okay, I'll ask. I'll ask. Um, so this question from Lynn is, the Brookline Police Department reported the following traffic crash data for 2019. 52 motor vehicle versus pedestrian crashes, 36 motor vehicle versus pedestrian crashes with injury. During the last two months, presumably of this year, there have been zero reported motor vehicle versus pedestrian crashes. Uh, the mayor of Paris has stated, quote, in total, 50 kilometers of lanes normally used by cars will be reserved for bicycles, end quote. She also said another 30 streets would be made pedestrian only, quote, in particular around schools to avoid groups of people, end quote. Should Brooklyn close certain streets to motor vehicles, specifically to the Precinct 11 and Quarry Hill neighborhood? Should Brooklyn reconsider its street design for the Driscoll School project and make streets like Westbourne Terrace pedestrian only? Uh, the order for this is John and then Heather and then Eric, so John. Thank you again, and thank you, Lynn. Um, 
I, I want to say a number of things about bicycling and, and also the virtues of walking and uh, the virtues of sustainable transportation. The first thing I want to say is that possibly that one of the most exciting things in this campaign for me has been to fully appreciate how active and how involved and how determined the bicycling community in Brookline is. I think we must have one of the best in the greater Boston area and um, including a state rep, Tommy, uh, who's an avid bicyclist. Uh, and I think that that, that level of, of um, energy and, and in involvement in uh, all of these sustainable transportation issues is great. And I think it's very telling that even with all of that, we still have unacceptable numbers of accidents involving bicycles. And we have unacceptable numbers of accidents um, that ought to be regularly recorded by the police, but not just recorded, ought to be analyzed in terms of what is, what is the major cause of these and how can our sustainable transportation policies uh, be, in, uh, in, be, be tailored uh, both to sustainability and to safety for bicyclists. I think the two go hand in hand. So what has happened recently with the COVID-19 experience involving um, the, the reservation of special uh, lanes on Longwood Avenue, um, Harvard Street, uh, and Beacon Street is, I think, the way to the future. Uh, but it's only the beginning. I think the bridal path needs to be seriously, uh, uh, needs, to, needs to go forward in a serious way. Um, and I think we need to look at other areas of Brookline where the kinds of uh, temporary, and I hope they don't remain temporary, um, uh, changes to streets in the Coolidge Corner area become a model for changes to streets all over Brookline. But the overall goal has to be an integrated system where walking gets a higher priority, bikes get a higher priority, and we deal with the presence of cars by rethinking where the position of cars in the urban transportation network. And I'll leave it at that, because I think I'm, I'm probably going on longer than uh, I should. Yeah, we'll try to keep it to 90 seconds. We're trying not to be too I'm sorry. with time. Yeah. That's okay. Um, and uh, we didn't give you that at the beginning, so it's, it's no problem. Uh, thank you, John, and on to Heather. Um, I believe that I've shown myself to be a real leader on this issue. I, I do have a background in it. It is probably like one of the most passionate things that I uh, care deeply about. Um, I fought for that proposal to um, to to go before the select board for us to vote on it and for it to be a majority decision and then upheld it when it came back to the select board the second time uh, to widen the sidewalks during COVID um, in the locations that John listed. I am absolutely open to not only making that somewhat permanent, you know, we'll have to see what makes sense as things start to open and there's more demand for uh, parking on, on the street. Um, but I, I remain open to identifying streets that make sense to, uh, to do uh, pedestrian only. Um, you know, it's, a, it's difficult because you've got residents in the area that need to be able to get in there and we don't have enough police to enforce. So it really needs to be um, self-imposing um, enforcement, which is tricky. But I think everybody sees the potential. During this crisis, everybody sees why it, it is so badly needed to widen our sidewalks. And even the businesses, I think, who have long since uh, uh, said that they would love to do more outdoor seating, but there's not enough space in the sidewalk. I think we can all see potential for what life could be like when we really start to put pedestrians first. And I just want to close by saying I, I try to uh, go to the Safe Routes to Schools uh, meetings. And every week there is a pedestrian that is hit by a car. It's every other week that it's serious enough where the person needs to be transported to the hospital. Those are unacceptable numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Heather and Eric. 
and unmute it. Okay. <laughs> You'd think I'd be better at this by now. Um, so yeah, I um, live now in precinct 10. I live at 1569 Beacon Street, all the way um, one precinct over. Um, and uh, for the, I was um, dating a guy, sorry, I, uh, his name is Teddy Weinberg. He uh, owns a condo in Colonial Arms, uh, which is in precinct 11. So for the whole first year that we were dating, we were back and forth across Beacon Street. We called our relationship across the street. Mm -hmm. um, Teddy now lives with me at 1569 Beacon, and, uh, but he still owns his condo in, uh, in precinct 11. I mention this because we both live on different versions of a bikeway. At 1569, on my side of Beacon, the, the eastbound side, it's a bikeway that has cars to the right-hand side of it and traffic to the left. In front of Teddy's building, at Colonial Arms, the bikeway is somewhat protected. I would call it a, a buffered bike bikeway. That's pretty much the nicest thing we can say about it. Um, neither of these is yet effective enough to get people safely through Brookline. I'm looking for a true protected bike route and a road redistribution of Beacon Street especially. but while we're at it, I think we need to look at our other um, transit ways and think about what is it like to commute by bike around Brookline? Is it only for daredevils who feel really safe? I see um, cars cross the bike lane every day in front of my building, just simple things that are necessary to park, for an Uber to drop something off. These like transient idling um, situations need to be addressed in a different way. I'd like to have a drop up point per block for Ubers, for example, or, or uh, food deliveries, and then have a true protected bikeway as far as we can. If we can get it all the way from Cleveland Circle to St. Mary's, I think that would be incredible. Um, I walked to Driscoll every day as a child. I you know, came down the path from Mason Terrace and went up Westbourne. I, I don't know that Westbourne needs to be made pedestrian free, but if the residents of Westbourne Terrace would like it, I don't see why we wouldn't explore that. I, you know, at the same time, there's logistics of getting people to and from New Driscoll. So we have to think, um, is that what the community is really looking for? In any case, I've been advocating for protected bike lanes. I've been advocating for road redistribution and for much, much higher priority to be given to non on vehicle traffic, especially low emissions or self-powered vehicles like bikes. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, next question is from Rebecca Redner. Uh, this is, we'll go in order of uh, Heather, Eric, John. What can or should the town of Brookline do to sustain and support small businesses, both during COVID-19 and beyond? and please be as specific as possible. Thank you. So Heather. Yes, well, I would be remiss to not point out that um, fellow select board member Raul Fernandez hosts a now weekly meeting with the Small Business Development Committee every Thursday morning. I understand that we have been uh, providing a lot of information for businesses. In the beginning, it was you know, asking attorneys who uh, just volunteered their time at the committee to, to try to navigate whether it made financial sense for their employees, who, whether they should be furloughed, laid off, or, um, uh, or reduced hours. Um, so providing as much information as possible to these private businesses, um, we would love to offer financial assistance. I, believe that the safety net fund um, may be able to help um, in certain situations. Um, but it's it's going to be very, very tricky. Uh, we're going to see a lot more guidance come from state and federal. Um, I think some of the uh, some of the businesses that have been able to manage to keep some of their employees, you know, on the payroll have access to some funds. But I've also heard reports that you know, it's not really what what was described in the beginning. So there are all kinds of financial hurdles uh, going forward. Um, we have a great uh, economic development team uh, that work for the town led by Kara Bruton, and she's fantastic. She really knows her stuff. She knows um, most of the people who own businesses, the chamber, um, a lot of these organizations, and I believe my time is up. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Heather. Um, Eric. 
Uh, thanks. Yeah, it's been a disaster for small businesses and I'm, I'm super worried about them as well. Um, one thing that um, gives me a tiny bit of hope maybe for some of our small businesses, we talk a lot about restaurants and I think restaurants are a certain category, but um, some of our other small businesses like stores, there is a potential for the select board to work to help these businesses move kind of outdoors for the next four months to use some of the sidewalk or potentially even part of the street. Um, to conduct business. I'm thinking about like Eureka, the, the toy and game store. Um, would it be possible for them to use a portion of the sidewalk to do some business so that um, they would be able to still um, dispense merchandise in a way that is safe? That's obviously not gonna work long term, not work in winter, but in the height of the pandemic, it could be the difference between a permanent going out of business and a temporary closure for a business like that. And I mean, we really, really have to fight to save our small businesses because that is, the definition of Brookline. When you go to a, a guidebook for Boston, it always says, oh, go to Brookline because of its unique local businesses. That's what makes our town unique. That's why people come here is Brookline Booksmith, Coolidge Corner Theater, et cetera. So it's up to us as select board, um, if I'm lucky enough to get elected, that would be the thing I would do is try to find a way to allow small businesses to continue to operate safely during the pandemic. I, I really don't like the word reopening. I think it's too soon, but safely mitigate the COVID-19 pandemic. And one way to safely mitigate might be to do a portion of their business outdoors. Thank you, Eric and John. If I may, before I answer this question, I want to circle back because I realized I didn't answer the question that Len had asked about Westbourne Terrace. And I apologize for that. Um, I quickly, I think it is much too soon to decide that Westbourne Terrace should be pedestrian only. Uh, and the reason is that I have actually made a practice when I can of monitoring meetings of the Driscoll Building Committee. And I know that um, very much under discussion um, are a number of issues, including pick up and drop off and delivery. Um, and and uh, until those issues are worked through and until the community has had a chance to weigh in. I think it's much too early in the process to be deciding it should be pedestrian only. Um, now, on to the question about small businesses. This is gonna to have to be maximum effort, maximum uh, uh, across the board. Uh, we're gonna to have to continue the efforts that Raul has begun uh, to uh, meet regularly with the business community and pull out every stop in order to get them the assistance that's available, both from federal and state sources. Uh, we're, also, we're also going to have to apply resources from town hall in, in not only more intensive ways, but in more creative ways. The public health department is going to have to be involved with every single business virtually every day to try to make sure not just that they are complying with um, uh, the new requirements of living in the post-COVID-19 world, but that in fact, that we are helping them to reassure their customers that it's, it's safe to come back um, and to reassure everyone that the rules are clear um, and, the, and the rules are being followed and that that's going to make it safe to visit restaurants again. It's going to make it safe to visit retail operations again. And I wanna mention one other thing, which um, I think about a lot these days. If you go to um, you know, the data on Brookline in terms of the employers um, in Brookline, you'll find that the, the most significant, if not the most significant employer in Brookline is, guess what, town hall, Brookline government. Um, we are a major, the town of, Gov, town of Brookline is a major employer in Brookline. And we could, we could be doing things in terms of the presence of our employees in the heart of the town on a daily basis um, that maybe we're not doing enough of in terms of encouraging them to use the, um, the available retail operations that are nearby. Um, encouraging them maybe instead of two times a week, three times a week going out for lunch. Uh, and so I think we have to part, partner um, with the retail establishments in town and that's how we're going to get them back on their feet. Thank you. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have time to get to all the questions that were submitted during this meeting. We'll do one more. And if the select board candidates can keep it to 60 seconds or less just for this last question, that would be great. Also for all the participants after this, um, 
will if if you've shared your email we can share the select board members websites and contact information so if you have questions for them and you want to hear directly from them you can reach out to them so for our last question from uh, Lisa Schatz can the candidates talk about their positions on the Community Preservation Act uh, the order for this one is Eric John and then Heather so Eric uh, Community Preservation Act has been adopted by about half the cities and towns in the Commonwealth and um, is great for creating open space, great for creating affordable housing. Um, I do not see why Brookline would uh, be a member of the Community Preservation Act uh, to create a, uh, what do we call it, a Community Preservation Fund. Um, at the same time, uh, unfortunately, we are not in a position right now where we can levy taxes on homeowners. That's just not something that at this moment we can do. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so as much as I value the, um, the opportunity to build more affordable housing and the opportunity to have more green space in our town and to control our destiny, um, there are issues uh, right now that are um, fairly pressing to do with COVID-19 pandemic, mitigating the pandemic, hanging on to the open space we have. Um, I got the 15 seconds remaining, so I will wrap it up there. Thank you very much. And please, please reach out to me directly. Ericforbrookline.com is my campaign uh, page. You can find my uh, email on there and my phone. I would love to hear from anyone in Precinct 11. You're my true home precinct. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, John. It's counterintuitive um, to be talking about um, something like the, the Community Preservation Act, which it would, would result in a slight incremental addition to how much we can raise um, on the property tax base every, uh, every year. On the other hand, I'm more than open to it. And here's why. We, we would be getting, we, we're, we're, lose, we're leaving money on the table by not being part of the Community Preservation Act. The Community Preservation Act offers state reimbursement or, or a state uh, uh, throw-in of 50% of whatever the community raises. And we, in a, by not participating in the Community Preservation Act, actually get assessed fees, taxes, to pay for other people's benefit from the Community Preservation Act. So it's definitely something we should look at. And the other reason I would look at it is that it's incremental you can set it at 1%. And what it means is that 2.5% that you're limited to every year is actually 2.5% and a little more. John, thank you. We, we are trying. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Great. Thanks, John and Heather. So uh, I chair the Land Bank Study Committee, and we learned a lot about the Community Preservation Act. It went before town meeting, I believe, in 2002, and then it went to a townwide referendum in 06 where it failed. Um, so take nothing for granted. Uh, I, I agree with John that um, we, we are leaving money on the table. We actually, in fact, leave about uh, uh, $400,000 to $500,000 a year on the table. Um, we will be presenting warrant articles hopefully in the fall, and it will hopefully go before townwide uh, voters next year, um, but I think that this is absolutely something that we must do in order to preserve open space and affordable housing, which are usually the first to go when budgets get tight. Great. Thank you, Heather. So that concludes the select board candidates portion of the night. Um, Heather, John, and Eric, thank you so much. I know you guys have probably done more forums than we've ever had. So <laughs> one of the silver linings of being in this new virtual world. Um, but I'm really glad that uh, the Precinct 11 got a chance to hear directly from you. And again, for any participants, um, feel free to reach out to the board. You guys are welcome to stay or sign off, but thanks again for taking the time to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, all of you. So yeah. now, Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so now I'm just showing you what a sample ballot is gonna look like. This is what the Precinct 11 ballot will look like, whether you go in person or get it in the mail. Sorry about the kids. You can see the select board candidates up in the top left. 
And I'm showing you this because um, I also want you to see that there's two sections for town meeting members here on the ballot. And we'll ask each of these candidates to introduce themselves. But first, Nick is just going to give a quick explanation about what's going on here. Why we have uh, 10 people running for seven spots, <laughs> basically. <Yep. laughs> um, so I will say this is, this is really good news. Um, I remember when I uh, was interested in running three years ago, looking into past elections, and Precinct 11 was a little bit sleepy in terms of town meeting. It was usually a lot of uncontested races. So this year we have 10 people running, 10 candidates, and we have seven spots. Um, and normally it works a little differently than that. So the reason that we have that shorter term, we have three people running for two spots for a one year term. So that happens when somebody basically who was elected vacates, they move or uh, can no longer be a town meeting member. So we're filling in um, those sort of two open spots that are extra spots. And then we have, um, I believe it's seven of us running for the five three year terms. Um, so that's why you see that on the ballot and the instructions are really clear. You can vote for five in that top section and you could vote for two in that bottom section. Great, thank you, Nick. So what we'd like to ask the candidates to do is now we'll go through each candidate in order based on the order that's here. So starting with Bonnie, then David Lowe, then Rebecca, and going through the list to, to speak for one minute about their candidacy and the issues that are important to them. And then we will open up for questions. Again, 60 seconds, Shauna's gonna keep time. Um, and starting with Bonnie, please make sure that you're not muted when you're trying to talk and that you are muted when you are not trying to talk. Okay. Hi, I'm Bonnie jones -Dayson. Um, This is my second term. I already completed um, a, a one year and then I had a three year term. This is my second time for, for the election. Um, I'm a social worker and um, I always run on, on social justice. And um, this year I, you know, with the pandemic and all that's going on, it's kind of crazy because people are not really sure, you know, what's next and what's going, you know, going to happen. But my hope for next year to be part of this is also the the Driscoll School in our precinct that we know it's it's still overcrowded and again we don't know what's going to happen when school starts. So my candidacy basically basically is to support um, affordable housing, especially for our seniors and our vulnerable population, make sure that they are well taken care of. The Driscoll School and also transportation and the bike path, because having seen the, the new configuration of the roads, I think it's something that we need to really try to keep permanent because it's safe. I can walk, you know, and it's so different. I've seen so many people almost get run over. And I think that is something that we need to really focus on moving forward is try to see what this pandemic has brought out in the in the good in the town and trying to keep that. Bonnie, so, thank you. I, I can thank you. Trying to keep yep, thank you. Good evening. Thank you for being here and um, I hope everyone's keeping well. Um, it's it's funny times. Uh, I, I came on board uh, I think it is 10 years now. There are four terms because of some changes in the length. Um, and I, I was first invited uh, to run by uh, two illustrious members who are here, uh, now Judge Joseph Ditkoff and even before that, um, Tommy Vitolo, so good company. Uh, my, the reason I got involved was I was involved leading Climate Action Brookline and my focus is sustainability issues in all their forms. So um, climate is something that clearly we're, we're all progressive about, and I'm glad to see that. I um, feel like I'm in good company. Um, the schools, I would have said that, you know, the schools were the primary issue, but now everything has turned on its head and we really have to think with a clear and open mind how to address the new challenges post COVID, hopefully post. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Looks like Shauna got muted, right. but Rebecca Mountner. Yeah, sorry. Great. Hi, I'm Rebecca Plant Mountner. As I said, I live at the corner of Summit in York. I've been a town meeting member for 10 years. And um, 
I think the thing that has uh, been the hallmark of my time in town meeting is that I've worked consistently in many different ways on inclusion and making sure that more people are able to participate in town life. Um, my day job is working in affordable housing. I've had a, a role in working on affordable housing efforts in the town, but I've done a lot um, and I'm very committed to economic development, um, but I've done a lot of work uh, to make Brookline government more accessible. I was uh, brought an effort, uh, an initiative to change the scheduling of town meeting to make it easier for uh, working parents and lower income people to participate. And I know it's not just because of that, but there's been a dramatic change in the population of town meeting in the eight years since I brought that. And I've also worked to help folks who are not, uh, have not historically been active in town, bring more in articles and be effective in moving things through the process. Thank you. Uh, uh, great, thank you. Next, Nick, Nicole McClelland. Great. I'm Nicole McClelland. Um, I have lived in the Cory Hill area since I moved to Brookline in 2006, first on Beacon, then Atherton, then Jordan. So I'm somehow just been only in this neighborhood since I've lived here. Um, I'm a first term town meeting member. Um, I do want to start by recognizing it's Memorial Day. And, you know, in a sense, what we're doing here tonight is possible because of the sacrifices so many have made. So I want to take a minute to recognize that. Um, and then in terms of why I'm seeking re-election, um, it's funny because I can remember when I first considered running for town meeting saying to my husband, oh, it's only like going to be six nights a year. This is great. I can make a difference, be involved, and it'll be six nights a year, which is not actually how it turned out. Um, but it's been so worth it. And I will say I have two impressions every time I go into that auditorium for town meeting. One is, wow, like this is such an impressive effort by so many people um, giving of their time and expertise for the betterment of Brookline. And then the second thought I have is there are so many people missing from this room. This does not look like the population of Brookline. There are voices that are missing. We are here debating, talking, literally making laws that will change people's lives. And we're not even hearing from so many people that would be affected by this. And we're all worse off for that. So like Becca and many, many others, that's what I've been working, I would say the most on in town meeting. Um, I've joined the Commission for Women. I've put forth warrant articles um, and started a group called Inclusive Brookline. And my next project is childcare, which I think is more essential than ever. Oh, am I already at a minute? Yep. <laughs> so I hope I'll get a chance to, to finish the work I'm doing um, and that you'll vote on June 9th. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now the other Nick Gertler has an announcement. Yes, hi. So I have been, I was caucused in a year ago. I've been doing policy and strategy for 20 years, and uh, given things that have gone on over the last uh, several months, it's entirely feasible that my family will not be here over the next academic year, so I don't think it's appropriate for me to run on this ticket, but I uh, request that you consider me if I'm on that one uh, later on. But in the next 30 seconds, I just want to point out three challenges that you all have given the anachronistic form of government that was developed for probably a simpler time. Uh, the first one is it's going to be more essential than ever to reach consensus and to reach consensus on these issues before they get to town meeting. Uh, the second is scale. There are so many things that this town has to deal with for which it's just not big enough. And one of those is figuring out, for example, how to do distance learning in a school system that's only serving a population of 60,000. And the last one is coherence. There are a lot of great ideas and a lot of people who believe strongly in, in issues, but those issues have to be prioritized perhaps more than ever and trade-offs have to be made and the structure of anyone being able to propose anything uh, doesn't quite work. So, can we, look. we're trying to just, thank you. We're trying to keep everyone to a minute, please. Okay, Let's next, Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen. Is Mary Ellen on? Moran? Nope. Okay. So next, um, Lisa Schatz is our other non-incumbent for the three-year seat. Hi. Um, do you hear me okay? Okay, good. So 
So uh, this is the first time I'm running. I've, I haven't been involved in, in, in the town and in, in government because I thought my life's work is, is um, an electrical engineering professor. And what I do is um, I'm on the chair of my department and we target uh, students from the inner city and we provide them with enough supports that research has shown can lead to success in electrical engineering. So that was gonna be my, my thing, my contribution to society. But then I became uh, more and more aware that, um, that housing is a huge, huge issue. And I, actually, I don't know if I'm gonna be elected because I'm actually uh, representing people who can't afford to live in Brookline. So I wanna bring in people who can't afford to live here I want them to live here because I think this is a, you know, we have all kinds of housing. And, um, and I was very impressed with the work by Raj Chetty at Harvard, who said that the way to, for uh, young people who are born in, in, in poverty, the way for them to get out of it, the best thing is to live in a diverse community with, um, pe with people with resources. And they, studies have shown they've done the best. So I thought Brookline is the perfect place for that. We have all kinds of housing, Thank you. except that people can't afford it. So, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to open up to questions after we do all the intros. And now we're going to have our three one-year candidates. First, um, yeah, David welcome. Kruinghouse. Yep. Hi, my name is David Kruinghouse, and I live on Westbourne. Uh, my family uh, moved here five years ago, and I've never lived in a town before. And I find the town government inscrutable. And so when I saw that there was a one-year term filling in the seat, uh, it seemed like a good way to learn about the town. Um, I am a year-round bike commuter, and some of the things that Len was advocating for, I'm a big support of, supporter of. Um, the things I've seen on the roads as a biker are terrifying, and it'd be great if Brookline could take the lead on those kinds of issues. Thanks. Great, thank you, David. On to Nancy Tsung. Yes, I, um, I just moved to here uh, one year ago from Lexington. And my um, most important thing for me is education. Uh, I have three uh, grandchildren. I really like them to have a very good school system. And um, I am pretty new in the government affair. I did research, I started my own company, and now I retire and I, I think I will try to um, learn how to involve the government affair. And then also I think if I can do some contribution, that would be great. Fantastic, thank you, Nancy. And last but not least, Ann Weaver. Hi, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> dogs were barking. Um, let's see, hi, I've been a resident of Brookline since 2008. My husband and I moved here when our kids were in preschool. Um, they, our kids are now in the eighth and ninth grades. Um, I'm a psychotherapist, I'm an adjunct professor at BU and I'm finishing a PhD in my ripe old age at Lesley University on post-secondary prison education. I have actively participated in various town matters over the years, including supporting Gerald Alston in his ongoing and ongoing and ongoing civil rights lawsuit against the town. In 2017, I organized a very successful petition to improve Brookline's sanctuary city policies. Uh, my son is a 15-year-old African-American and both explicit and underlying racism toward people of color is an issue of deep personal importance to me, especially in this age of Trump. And I, am I really out of time? Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. Anne. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, so now we're going to open up for questions. Um, one question that's come in that's both for current and um, potential town meeting members is about construction and improvement in the neighborhood. So if any, um, David Lascoy or anybody else who has updates on what's going on on neighborhood improvements could maybe update the neighbors and then the candidates can also answer about improvements that they would like to see and work towards. Um, I can say that um, 
we've been working on trying to get crosswalks on Summit Ave, and we're hoping that that is going to happen. It's already the end of May, so they told us in the spring. So we're working on that. Um, other other updates on construction or from the candidates, um, things that they would like to see happen in our neighborhood. Actually, it's David Lescalier. Actually, I noticed that the humps are up there with temporary signs. Uh, it seems like they have to come back and do some painting and add some uh, signs uh, before and after. But I think it's we're sort of probably more than halfway to, to finishing that project. Uh, regarding um, Driscoll School at the most recent uh, Driscoll Building Committee, uh, there was some revived interest actually in Len Wally's suggestion. So I think if he hasn't heard about it, it's time to cycle a uh, circle back in terms of providing uh, uh, additional space and a better traffic flow during the different stages of construction. Great, and then we can go through the candidates. Maybe we'll start with um... Rebecca, and then we can go through the list in order if anybody has any comments on improvements that they'd like to see or work towards um, in the neighborhood. Well, I think what I'll just add is, I just didn't get to say my work is in affordable housing development, and I work in a lot of different cities and towns across the Commonwealth. And I think when there are things that need to happen in our, in our neighborhood, whether it's schools or the other capital improvements and uh, folks did a lot of great organizing around Quarry Hill. Um, it's just um, we can help as town meeting members make sure that process is inclusive so that uh, neighbors who will be affected and others can really have input so it can be both the things we care most about and done in a way that's really respectful of people's lives. Okay, Nick, you're next in order. Nick McClelland and then Nick Gertler. Um, yeah, to echo what David said, um, the traffic calming at Summit has finally started um, and actually been implemented. So that was a, a good group effort to get that done. With Shira, I would love to work next on crosswalks at Short Street, where it crosses Summit, and Mason Terrace, where it crosses Summit. I think we need safer pedestrian crossing in both of those locations. I think it's ridiculous that we don't have a single crosswalk on Summit until you get to the crest of Summit. Um, and just in terms of construction updates, I don't know if this was specific to the question, but um, we will see likely a lot more vehicular traffic in the Quarry Hill neighborhood because there are developments at the end of Jordan Road where it meets Quarry Hill. Um, three major developments happening and Quarry Road in Washington. So I'm happy to tell people more about those. I don't want to take up a lot of forum time for that. Um, but several town meeting members have been discussing that. Most, much of that is Boston, so our hands are tied in a lot of ways, but it's something for us to be aware of and thinking about traffic calming. Thank you, Nick. Okay, Nick Gertler, are you going to bow out of questions since you're withdrawing your candidacy, or do you want to comment? I'm going to respectfully bow out. I've seen Nicole and Becca's work over the last year, which I was very impressed by, and without wanting to take anything away from the others, uh, I would urge you all to certainly include them in your slate of, uh, of candidates that you vote for. Great, Lisa Schatz is next about construction in the neighborhood. Yeah, well, what compelled me to run is noticing on Summit Avenue that when a little house is, is sold, it's knocked down and they make this big giant big house, but still single family. But that big house could house very comfortably two or three families. So that, that's my issue is uh, changing zoning laws so that we could have three family homes in the same space as one family homes, which would be much more affordable. Okay, next, David um, Coringhouse. All right. Um, well, I'm going to focus on Westbourne. <laughs> um, uh, I think Len's proposal is fantastic, and I live in one of the houses that would be blocked. Um, there's a stretch between the last driveway on the Beacon side and the first garage on Westbourne, and the amount of play space the kids are going to have during construction is unacceptable, and if we could claim some of that space temporarily for play space, 
I'm all in. So that's what I'm focused on. Thank you, David. Nancy. Um, I, I'm pretty new in this town, but I met some of my my neighbor, and they always uh, thinking how how come Summit Avenue is road is not repaired, right? And so, is there any way after we don't know the schedule? So after and start do all this work, are they coming back to pave the road? This is one thing I like to know. And second thing is. I'm not in construction, a uh, role in construction. I have no knowledge how they do it. But all I know is when they are doing it, doing the summit, um, NSTAR, uh, uh, National Grid is doing work on Summit Avenue. Why they put so much sand? So whenever they left the job and then car draw by, then I don't feel it's so healthy to walk on the street because the dust is uh, flying all over. And luckily we wear masks. And sometimes if, if you don't want to wear a mask, you want to breathe the fresh air, it's just impossible. So I'm healthy. So- Nancy, thank you. Yeah. Oh, we're just trying to keep everyone to one minute. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Nancy, those are good points. Ann Weaver. Hi, um, I guess the issues in the neighborhood that are of most concern to me are monitoring the Driscoll renovation knockdown to make sure that it's the, it has the least impact on the neighborhood, um, as well as on the kids, obviously, and, in, and keeping play space available is really important. Um, I really believe in increasing bike lanes in this town. Um, my son, when high school existed, um, would bike to and from um, the, the old Lincoln School. And we were always concerned about how he negotiated some of the, the roads between Mason Terrace and, um, and the school. So that's increasing bike lanes is really important to me. And like other people have said, affordable housing is an issue that I think we really need to work on in this town, increasing opportunities for affordable housing, particularly for people like the elderly um, and disabled folks and, and people of low income to increase diversity in this town and keep people here who might need to move out otherwise. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Um, next is Bonnie. Yeah, for me, it's, um, I live on Lancaster and um, I'm a, an avid walker. And I, I agree with uh, um, Nick, Nick and some of the others about that intersection at Short Street. It's very treacherous and it's very dangerous. And also what I would like to see um, become a permanent fixture is that new configuration along Beacon for the pedestrians. And I think that should be connected with Marion as a bike path. So these are some of the things that I think is pretty interesting. And as a, a, as a walker, you know, you can see differently than when you drive. And walking along there with the new configuration with the um, extension of the road for pedestrians, I think that is something that should be considered in a permanent way. Thank you, Bonnie. And lastly, David, on this question of neighborhood construction. Uh, Ms. David? Yeah. <laughs> Too many of us. Um, thank you. I agree with a lot of the comments that I've, I've heard already. And I appreciated early on Len's proposals around traffic at Driscoll and uh, I'm intrigued and curious what neighbors uh, input would be. Uh, that, that's critical, of course. On construction, I was glad to work with, uh, glad to hear about the progress. I worked with uh, Nick and David Lescoyer about uh, about the crosswalk at the top of Summit. So I'm thrilled to hear that's gone in. I haven't been up there recently. Um, and uh, now I have a reason to go. Um, there's a lot of construction, especially Mason Terrace, uh, home construction. I agree with the the boxing issues. But one thing that we have a bit more control over perhaps is the noise and idling and dust and just the construction activity could be um, done a little bit with a little bit less impact on neighbors. Um, no sooner one is finished, another one pops up and starts and feels like constant noise. And pollution. Thank you, David. 
Okay, so we're going to go to another question, but I just wanted to give a brief update um, about the construction that I realized I forgot to make in, in light of Nancy's um, question. When they were replacing the gas line, I, I did ask them about what, what the process was. And just so you guys know, the answer is that they put in a new gas line to handle the issue of the leaks so that the, you know, the, um, that, that issue of all the trees dying that we've been lobbying for for a long time, they finally put in a new pipe. They did not take out the old pipe and they have not activated, they haven't connected the new pipe because they need to go into each person's house to do that. So the infrastructure is there now underground, but we're not using the new pipe. We still have the old leaky pipe, which is where the gas is flowing right now. And only when they're able to go into each person's house, um, check that the meters and the pressure and all of that is okay and activate it, will the gas then flow in the new pipe. They'll turn off the gas to the old pipe and leave it underground. So that's, we, we've gotten through, I think, what the toughest part of the construction is in terms of ripping up the road and putting it back, but we haven't gotten the benefit quite yet because they, they aren't running the gas through there. So that's just one other update. Um, if anybody has anything to add to that. <laughs> um, but thank you, Nancy, for reminding us about that. So one last um, question that has come up over and over that we'd like to hear candidates address is the issue of the schools. Um, how will you monitor what's going on at Driscoll? How do you see that project um, playing out? What is our role? What, how should it play out any differently um, given the current situation? And then how do you see that playing into other schools? Because town meeting votes on, on all of the schools funding, um, so renovations at Pierce and other places. So we re received a number of questions about this issue. We'd love to hear everybody speak. Um, we're going to start this time with the two year, uh, sorry, one year candidates, um, starting with uh, David Kuringhaus, and then we'll go down through the list again. So David. I have no idea. Um, well, um, let's see. Um, I guess we need to make sure that the system, you know, that the school works out for kids as it's going. I'm glad they're not going to Old Lincoln School, but are they going to be in a clean place and are they going to have a place to play? And um, I'm not that worried about the class sizes. I think that's going to be an issue that COVID is going to disrupt anyway. But um, those are sort of my initial thoughts. Great, thank you. Nancy, on the schools and overseeing them. Nancy? I don't Hi, Nancy, we can't hear you. We want to know about... Um, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, one thing is why the school, my children elected this, I encourage the same thing too. Can school like a delay maybe 30 minutes? Let's, the kids have enough sleep. This is one thing. And second thing is, I come from Taiwan, right? And all the Asian, they, they're great school. They, we, we stay at school until five. And Maybe we should extend the school, especially for this, this, this virus thing. The, the children have been falling behind. So maybe we can extend school to until four o'clock, have a school more hour. This is, this is what I, I like to see is that uh, any way we can make a school, school day or school hour extend a little bit. Great, thank you. Ann Weaver. Hi, um, in terms of monitoring the Driscoll expansion, uh, renovation, uh, the three of us, the one-year candidates, are all new to, to this process. So I think, you know, I'm probably speaking for all three of us by saying we need to learn from you guys, the, the folks who've been in town meeting and, and know more about the, the policies and procedures in terms of monitoring something like that. Um, but obviously, I strongly feel it needs to be monitored um, in terms of budget, especially in the COVID age where budget, um, town budgets are gonna be of much more concern than they used to be. Um, and also in terms of thinking about the other schools in Brookline and what needs to happen there as well, uh, Pierce being a big issue. And I know that the, um, the state might give, has said they're willing to give money toward Pierce 
if it's a four section school and I know there's been issues about that in terms of if that's big enough thank for peers. So thank you. Thank willing you. to learn from you guys. Great. Thank you. Uh, moving to the top of the ballot, Bonnie. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'm not sure about the monitoring or how we monitor, but moving forward, I think we need to make sure that the budget covers what the initial plan was. Um, you know, all the, the improvement that is supposed to go into the new building. And as far as the other school, I think after, after Driscoll, hopefully we'll be able to do all the other um, renovation and updates and the other schools that need to get fixed. But I think just because should be an example and in monitoring, I think we need to monitor to make sure that it has stood up to the standards and what we had already voted for. Great, thank you. David Lowe. Hi. Um, so I, I didn't mention before, I'm a Driscoll parent or former Driscoll parent. My daughter is in the high school entering, I guess she's still a sophomore, um, but looking towards junior. Um, so I had eight great years in Driscoll and uh, felt very close to it. So I want to see it succeed and, and go well. Uh, as far as monitoring it, aside from David living across the street and looking out the window at it, uh, fiscal management, clearly uh, they, we've succeeded finally on uh, energy issues. There's solar on, going on the roof and it will produce about half of its uh, energy needs, which is excellent. Um, as I said, I'm curious about the traffic flow, um, but I think th the critical thing to add is that we are representatives in the community and it's, it is incumbent on us to help bring our neighbors along and, and make sure that people know what's going on. That hasn't always been done successfully. Uh, I'm guilty to, of that too. Great, well now, now we realize how Zoom can make this easier to inform people, so. Okay, Rebecca. Um, well, I think there are a couple things. One is one of the things that I've noticed happens in Brookline and I've um, enjoyed it the last few years, but I'm about to age out is that if you're active in the public schools, if you're a parent in the public schools, it's really easy to stay connected to what's happening in the neighborhood. And there's a really great network, especially in the younger grades, because you just see each other in person. And as your kids get older, that gets harder. And um, we have to figure out with a project like this, I have no doubt that the parents of Driscoll age kids and almost Driscoll age kids will be really actively involved and the challenge is to figure out how to keep every, everyone else in the neighborhood involved. I've worked a little bit on some efforts like that um, it, when the COVID uh, lockdown began to happen, worked with some other town meeting members to expand our neighborhood listserv and Facebook group and you know we've experimented with things and I don't think if we found the perfect thing yet and look for, I think that's gonna be really crucial to continue to find new ways of communicating with each other and inviting people to participate. Um, the other thing I'll say about the Driscoll renovation is it is great the funding was committed, but we know that in times of budget crunches, it's often the first things that get uh, removed are some of the energy efficiency things and we need to be really uh, vigilant to make sure that we don't let short-term budget needs um, make us make decisions that will actually be much more costly in the long term. Thank, thank you. Um, and Nick, as a candidate. Yes. Um, so, you know, I do, I do think that uh, there's an extra onus on town meeting members to, to pay attention and to monitor these things. I feel a special obligation since I was uh, part of the crew that got the Driscoll project back on the ballot. Um, and just so people do know, if you go on the Driscoll Building Committee website, there's an area where you can get text or email updates. You just click and sign up. Um, and so you, if you want to stay updated, you can get that as well. What I try to do is review the meeting notes from those meetings. I usually can't attend them because they're right at like preschool or breakfast time. Um, but I have been following that. You know, that was one of the commitments of the campaigners. Um, and I do think we'll have some really hard decisions to be made. You know, one of the trade-offs with the project is that play space, outdoor space was gonna be greatly reduced for the duration of, or for, for a portion of the construction period. Um, and now that we know that the safest place to be in terms of 
COVID is outdoors, including for children, um, I think and hope that the Driscoll Building Committee will consider that and take a hard look at that. And I plan to uh, be bringing that up. Um, and I think there'll be a, a lot Thank to you. follow. Thank you. Okay, and uh, lastly, Lisa Schatz. Okay, well, I suppose as a town meeting member, we need to be responsive to our neighborhood. So if um, the neighborhood knows I'm on the town meeting and they have an issue, they could bring it to me and then I will find for the appropriate person to uh, address an issue uh, connected with building the school. So I'm, I'm new to this too. I've never been um, in town meeting and I don't really know the, the roles of the, the school committee and the town meeting. Um, members in this, but that's that's what I would try to do is um, try to make myself available to the neighborhood so that um, if they have a concern, I could try to direct it to the person that could address it. Fantastic. Thank you. And I, and I want to thank everybody who's putting themselves up as candidates, whether incumbents or new people. This is really what makes democracy work, as you guys know, and it's what makes the neighborhood work. Um, and it's great to have all of you here. So just to wrap up, um, I'm gonna invite David Lesquay. He has a few more updates about the school because he's on the Driscoll School Committee. I know there's a lot of interest. And then um, we'll, we'll see if there's any other announcements. Um, and I am gonna show some uh, slides and I'll also share them that have the links that we've been um, talking about. So I'll hand it over to David. Okay, thank you, uh, Shira. Um, I wanna emphasize again, uh, Len Woolley came and did a presentation to the building committee. And um, actually now, uh, as the com committee is struggling with the logistics of providing place baits during construction, actually at the last meeting, they're saying, we want to go back and revisit uh, Len's suggestions. We think there's some potential there. That's the first thing. Second thing, uh, at, the, at the May meeting, the architect uh, reported on the 50% design development. And at this point, the uh, project is 3% over budget. So there's some value engineering going on, which uh, brings me to Rebecca's point. We have to really watch about where things are cut out. The 100% design development is, is slated to come about in June, this will be a very important time for anyone like Nicole who's following this to be sure to um, monitor and see where the chips have fallen with the value and engineering decisions that were, were, being, were being made between May and June. And the third thing is that I heard at the last meeting, there's a possibility that some work will start on the foundation next March just to make it all real, that what we're talking about pretty soon is gonna become reality. Thank you. Great, any questions for David? Okay, Nick, any announcements on your end? Yes, not as a candidate. Um, I just wanna remind, I wanna thank everybody again for participating and being here. This was a better turnout than I thought we might have. Um, so I'm, I'm glad there was that interest. Just a reminder, our election date is Tuesday, June 9th. The polls are open from noon until 8 p.m. And you have until tomorrow, basically, right? To get your, Becca, is that right? Yeah, to get your application, to mail to the town, to request a mail-in ballot so that you don't have to go to the polls. But if you choose, you can go to the polls on uh, Tuesday, June 9th. And the only other thing I wanted to put out there is my fellow town meeting members might kill me, but if there is interest, I would love to know if there is neighborhood interest in doing something like this more regularly, um, because it really is a good way to get updates like Becca said and Jira and others. You know, we try and talk a lot about how to do what we're supposed to do, which is actually hear from constituents and let them hear from us. And we've tried the listserv and Facebook and all the rest, but the meetup is a really good sort of more open platform and forum. So, uh, you know, we don't want to do it if people don't want to do it, but if you are, um, I imagine that that's something you could do. So I would love to hear from people what you thought, what we could do better, and if you'd be interested in doing these occasionally. Thank you. 
And I put in the notes, um, our Facebook group and our listserv. And if you can get your neighbors on both sides of you and anybody you know in the neighborhood to sign up for the listserv or the Facebook group, they'll be that much more useful with um, that many more people on it. But that we already have, um, I think 150 or 200, 200 people on the uh, listserv and, and then you know, a lot of people on the Facebook group too. So it's a good way to keep in touch with folks. We had um, some growth around the emergency, which is I mean, yep. we're running. Yeah. So I'll send around in, on the email list um, all of the, the important links that we've collected through this meeting. Um, some questions didn't get answered, and I'm sorry about that, but please feel free to be in touch with the candidates directly, um, and uh, we'll make that their contact information available as well, if it's okay with all the candidates. And thank you all. It's nice to see you when we're all locked up in our houses. So <laughs> nice to see all of you neighbors. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank Good night, Thanks. everybody. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night.